three, two, one. Hey everybody, it is Monday, it is Insomniac Live, and we're doing another Play Live with a special guest. I hope some of you guys recognize, just by face alone, without me even having a name drop, this is Ted Price, who made Spyro. With a whole bunch of other people, but mm -hmm. yeah. Had, had fun making Spyro. With and much other yeah, people. we're going to be playing Spyro Reignited today, and it'll be really cool to see Ted's um, reaction and interpretation to like all the you know cool new things that have gone into uh, the Reignited trilogy, and then share some like memories, I guess, from yeah, you know, the old experience of making the original one. And at the same time, we're also going to be supporting uh, St. Jude Play Live mm -hmm. all stream, like we're doing all month. And I got some nice little thingies here. All right. So if you're watching our stream from uh, Periscope or Twitch or YouTube, you might as well click on insom.games slash play live and watch us through there. Because if you do and you donate $1 or more, you are entered into a raffle. Every Friday, we're giving away a whole bunch of stuff. We got these signed Ratchet art books. They're really cool. Yeah. And we got all this St. Jude swag, which is like overlapping on top of St. Jude on top of St. Jude. Um, we have giant mouse pads, we have t-shirts, backpacks, tumblers, and a gaming chair that is going to go away on the final Friday. So you should definitely support the cause, it is a great cause. Alright, so without further ado, let's go to Camp B. Okay. We'll get right into the game here. All right. We have played this before, so you can just go ahead and hit continue and yeah, we can, can choose whatever to add on. Oh man, now, <laughs> now this, this brings is a, up... This is a tough one. <laughs> now, okay. What would you? What would the, well, what would the oh, watchers yeah. prefer? Yeah, we play. Here. We have this thing set up. When we get donations, um, it will notify us. The first person that donates and says in the chat what one they want us to play is the one we're gonna play. All right, All right. that's fair. Um, oh, we got someone hosting. Oh, that's, that's cool. Okay. So, well, Key and Prime wants Spyro three, but Key and Prime, did you did you drop any scratch oh, on us? Because that's, on St. Jude. Yeah. You got to pay to play, buddy. Um, and I, I will say St. Jude is one of the most amazing charities in terms of what they do for kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really speaks to us at Insomniac because we have always had an affinity for um, charities that support kids, given that a lot of our games are very kid-friendly, family-friendly. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've seen... Uh, many do great things but St. Jude's has been consistent and they've continued to grow and yeah. just reach more and more kids and families who are in difficult situations and make their lives better and that's really commendable. Yeah I think they do amazing work and it's also really impressive to see how much they're growing and how much they're working with the gaming community exactly. yeah. and um, bringing in this whole new audience because I think that um, you know the gamer demographic they don't really you don't really associate them with like charity it's kind of more something that like you know uh, grandparents write the check, you know, whatever, and then they've managed to modernize it and make it streamlined and, you know, something important and relevant for, uh, you know, gamers and like a whole new audience that might not have been I, focused on that type of thing. I well, I I've always been impressed with the gamers' generosity. Uh, players have been giving back to charities uh, through other charities like Child's Play mm -hmm. uh, for years and years, and that's. I look at Insomniac and we're the same way. We are a company of, of players and we've always been very, um, and we felt that giving back to, especially to kids was important, especially mm -hmm. to people in need. Definitely. So uh, go industry basically is what I'm saying yeah. and go gamers because we can make a difference and we can make a difference while we're having fun, which is you know kind of a, yeah. a double win. Yeah, for sure. So hopefully somebody has contributed and um. We got someone, we got a new follower. We're still waiting for, well, I want to double check with Tim. Or if, uh, Tim or Thomas, if you guys are modding the stream, could you confirm if our uh, donation thing is in fact working? I think it is. But anyway, while we're waiting, Ted, why don't you give me a rundown? Like, I know you've worked on these for years and then they were also years and years ago. Yes. But just in like, one sentence summary of each one. What's like your main takeaway off the top of your head for each one? Like, oh, this was the one where this happened. Sure. This was well, the one where that. I, I think I can talk about it from an insomniac perspective versus an in-game perspective. So mm -hmm. Spyro the Dragon was the breakout hit for us. Mm -hmm. We were 
Unknown, we had made Disruptor, which was called the best game that nobody's ever heard of, <laughs> as part of a review that was actually written. And when we made Spyro, it was a big departure for us from what we had been doing, but it was suddenly recognized by players and, and the press as something unique, and that helped us blow up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then Spyro 2 was us asking, what can we do that will be be appropriate to continue the story, what will feel familiar to fans, but will introduce enough new concepts that mm -hmm. players are going to get excited about what's going on. And in Spyro 3, You're the Dragon, this was us going, wow, we did a lot of stuff in Ripto's Rage, what else can we do? How can we make Spyro, this character who doesn't feel, who has a very limited set of moves, and expand it without changing him as a character? And so mm -hmm. we added quite a few other characters to the game right. at that point and that helped create more gameplay opportunities at this point though we also knew that this was likely our last Spyro when we right mm -hmm. in the middle of development and we wanted to cap the story a bit with this one yeah makes sense um, when I was growing up I definitely played the first one the most okay but I did like the whole trilogy. The first, I think, just the first one, just the timing. I was the right age. How old were you when the first one came out? This well, was nineteen for us. It was ninety eight. That's the one. Yes, yeah, so I was twelve. Game. So okay. that's I'm right in the sweet spot, I think. And um, and then, yeah, I you know I was also playing Mario sixty four at the time too. Ah. And I remember the two, those two, they're just so game changing for me about how it's like you can just go in any direction. Yeah. You know, and that's just so huge to me. And you can kind of do the level the way you want to, and like you know just have being able to roam around and explore is like my favorite thing in games and so well, let's play a little, i think we play a little bit of each right yeah I mean, yeah we have plenty of time yeah yeah so but, let me just jump in and let me talk right. a little bit about that because mario 64 was a big influence on us and when we when we started creating prototypes for spyro after we knew we wanted a dragon mm -hmm. we, we spent a lot of time watching or playing mario and i remember brian hastings would just run Mario around in a circle and make him flip, and, <laughs> and Al Hastings was, would be sitting there, and we'd all be looking at it going, okay, what makes this so special? Mm -hmm. And we realized that anything you did with Mario felt good, just running around yeah. in a circle, and that was our goal. And so we spent hours just doing this <laughs> yeah. at our test levels, nice. to asking, okay, does it feel as good as Mario? Uh, is the control the right balance of responsiveness but also fluid animation mm -hmm. or does it provide fluid animation and that was that was actually pretty hard to get right because you can have a character who just stops on a dime right right Spyro slides if you notice and yeah. the reason we did that was because when we did stop him on a dime it might have felt a little bit better for gameplay but it looked really artificial okay. and I will uh, I want to give great kudos to the Toys for Bob guys who have of course recreated the trilogy and Look, got everything right. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they looked really hard at the animations and they they asked the same questions we did. And to their credit, they asked us for a little bit of advice and we were happy to uh, tell them what, you know, the kind of, give them uh, some background on the challenges we went through uh, during the first game. Mm -hmm. I don't remember this guy being this hard to kill. <laughs> I think it was, he was a one hit kill uh, initially. So let's go. I think so, someone donated to Corey. I'm going to check. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I saw that. Well, we're already locked into the first game, but we appreciate yeah, the donation. We can always, we can always <laughs> exit here. We're going to probably play all three this stream anyway. Let's check. Yeah. Um, and somebody found, I like the uh, shades on Spyro. Oh, somebody, we put those, we, we yeah, put those there's on. Yeah, a, there's a cheat code. But cheat codes, you put different things yeah. on. Yeah. Got it. Um, so another, another thing that we did, too, just to bring back memories, uh, we wanted to make sure that the transitions from levels felt seamless uh -huh. and of course there is still a load but Al Hastings figured out a way to have the what we call cycloramas mm -hmm. in memory so that you would see the skies as you were flying through them most yeah. games at the time would just give you a loading screen a oh yeah screen. I remember yeah because uh, you know PlayStation 1 and like you know playing a game on a CD was a, a new thing back then for me and it was I remember when my friend had one he was the only kid in town that had a PlayStation 1 at the time and he had Need for Speed, ah, and sorry. it was so cool, but that loading time was just, it's like, you're just gonna, you know, go make a snack and come back or something. Yes. 
And that oh, was Anthony M donated. Did it. One he did spiral one. Okay. Oh, great! Thank okay. you, Anthony. Twenty bucks. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, twenty. Yeah. Nice job. So um, I definitely appreciate all the work that went into making the loading here, you know, more seamless and and not just some like um, static screen. That yeah, we wanted to keep you in the game. It's that very was, immersive. Yeah, it's yeah, awesome. And so, uh, this this level, I remember Michael John uh, was. I think he designed this level. And this is all about learning how to glide well, mm -hmm. because as, as you saw before, there were some places you simply couldn't go without gliding. Right. And again, back back in these days in the '90s, we were thinking about game design in a slightly different way than we do now. Mm -hmm. uh, we we wanted to make it more logical, so you, we would very slowly layer new moves, mechanics, mm -hmm. etc. And we continue to reinforce them again and again, so you really committed them to muscle yeah, memory. Yeah. And of course the controls are a lot simpler than than you see in today's games, including our mm -hmm. own. So that was also uh, a way to create a more mass market game where people who may not have played a PlayStation 1 game could mm -hmm. pick up the controller and feel really comfortable about just jumping in. That was another thing I remembered about it, because at the time, going into 3D, it was tricky for me to just get the hang of oh now you can do all this is not just a side scroller and while i loved it i was also intimidated by it and uh that's a great know. point you know i think most a lot of people forget that at this time a lot most games were 2d yeah there were not many 3d games and one of the things that we wanted to do was to create a, more of an an open feeling world where it was pastoral you felt that you could see for miles mm -hmm. and um, even though maybe you couldn't go everywhere you could see like for example looking here the way we built our our worlds and again toys for bob did a really great job on this it looked very open mm -hmm. versus most of the games at the time the 3d games were super super closed off yeah. canyony yeah and you would and that was because most games could not draw mm -hmm. as much as well, we could in this game, <laughs> and and of course that was thanks to Al Hastings' wizardry. Um, way back, way back then, That's he was crazy. doing some amazing things. Yeah, uh, Al Hastings just blows me away <laughs> every time I come up to him with some question or I just sit and watch what he's doing. I'm like, I don't even understand, <laughs> but I this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes me wonder, like, um, you know, with. Movies. I've read some books about you know filmmakers who that were just starting out and then they became a big deal. And they talked about how they had to make a bunch of bad, low budget movies and practice movies before they got it right and started getting in their groove. But you guys, this is the second major game, and Disruptor's really solid too as your first game. I'm just kind of curious. You got so many things right. How and and back then it's like before you know, YouTube and social media, like Justin and I, if we want to learn how to do something, we can look at, you know, the top people already doing that and like watch the YouTube tutorial and deconstruct how it's done and then learn so much without having to go through it. But you guys had to like, it's a frontier and you had to figure out so much on your own. There wasn't some template that you could just follow, but you got so many things right. And that's what I'm kind of curious, like you're talking about the stopping you know not on the dime but kind of coming to a, a slow stop and then the loading screen being dynamic and stuff like that like there's so much stuff to just figure out when it hasn't been established yet it's not like a convention of gaming and and then you just kind of you know you're right there pioneering all this stuff well we i mean there were we had a lot of things working in our favor uh one of them was working with guys like mark cerny and michael john mm -hmm. who were experienced producers and had a lot of oh my I'm getting my ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> had, had a lot of great advice on uh, production techniques and game design. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned, Michael and Michael designed many of these levels. Mark did layout as well. Mm -hmm. And we would just we would have lots of discussions about what worked and what didn't, and what strategies we should use for say enemy layout, what le what length the levels should be. Mm -hmm. And that was that was. You know, I'll give Mark a lot of credit for this. He, he's a great analyst and would think hard about these things. Mm -hmm. Brian Hastings, too, who was also um, doing a lot of the gameplay programming on the games with the uh, with the AI. Mm -hmm. And But we did experiment. I mean, we, we had to learn a lot of stuff on the fly. 
Uh, another thing that we had going for us is that there were a lot of great games for us to reference back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mario probably being the best mm -hmm. when it came to understanding great level challenges and, and pacing in levels and mechanics. So, of course, we weren't making a Mario game. We were making something a little different, but we took a lot of hints from what um, Miyamoto did so well. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Miyamoto, we had all been brought up on Miyamoto games, too. I mentioned, um, I often mention Metroid being an influence right. for many of our games, and that's selfishly my biggest influence. That's um, your favorite game, right? Yeah. And you've cited oh that before. I don't remember these dogs being this mm. hard, though. I, this is something that I... Uh, I'm showing how out gonna of You're going to get one more chance, and then Justin has to take over. Okay, here we go. Justin's pretty good. Justin, you... Um, Spyro was like a big deal for you, too, Yeah, right? it definitely was. This is probably the like, earliest memory for me. Like, one of the first like things that stuck. And I was about seven. Okay. Seven years old. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember playing Super Mario uh, World like, at my grandparents. Mm -hmm. It was like, such a... But yeah, Spyro for sure. Over like, because I did get Ratchet too, and I was pretty in that age range. But mm -hmm. I don't know for some reason. Yeah, Spyro stuck out. I just I remember being obsessed with those dragon statues. Just like yeah, when they like you know the animations came mm -hmm. out and stuff, just like freaking out. Like, well, this <laughs> actually true. these were a lot of fun for us too yeah. because I remember when we were brainstorming on the dragon families, we spent a lot of time coming up with the different names and what yeah, their characteristics, the personalities. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so awesome. I enjoyed. Thanks. And then the I'm a big. Uh, like collector, like, uh -huh. like I, I collect like a lot of when I was little, I collected a lot of things. But in here, that's like a, you know, you're collecting, and like I loved. You know, it, I loved this that. is a collectathon. Yeah. In fact, we, yeah. we use that term pretty frequently because uh, what we what we wanted to be careful about. Oh my gosh! Okay, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna play this kind of undo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Is there any uh, questions to go for? Yeah, chat. Fine. You guys have been talking up a storm here. Sorry, we've been kind of just rolling, but I feel like there's some good story oh, time God, we got I'm going. Don't forget dodge roll. That's uh, dodge yes. Roll, yeah. You know what? I I'm so used to playing Spider Man. I've been uh, using sort of Spider Man controls, and not. That's mm -hmm. that's my excuse at least for failing so badly. Uh, Keem Prime said Clancy Brown voiced a lot of the <laughs> dragons. To roll he did. Oh, so the voice cast in this yeah. game was amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. I just died. Carlos Alas Rocky was sp was um, Spider Man was Spyro uh -huh. and. He was Carlos, as some people may recall, was the Taco Bell Chihuahua dog. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting typecast as a little animal guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we had heard that those commercials mm -hmm. and said, well, maybe we should try, find out who voiced the dog and um, see if we can grab him. And Jackie Wyrock, who was our audio person back then, was really hooked in with Hollywood and she, she found him and, and many of the other talented cast members who play the voices here, including Clancy Brown. I think we knew Clancy because he was also working with Naughty Dog on, I think it might have been Crash. That's how we, mm. and that, that connection might have been through Michael John. And if they're watching, they can probably Did you in. tell him, did you get to meet him and say, there can only be one? <laughs> no, I didn't. I would have no. done that to him. But, but <laughs> yes, he was popular because of that, uh, and at least within Insomnia. Mm. He's a bad guy in Highlander. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, here, let me refresh this, too, in case anyone is just tuning in now. We're here with Ted Price playing Spyro Reignited, and all month long, we are doing Play Live with St. Jude. So if you watch our stream on insom.game slash play live and you support the stream with at least $1, you're entered into a raffle with some cool prizes. And I have to get my glasses because I'd like to read the questions on the chat, and okay. I can't see them from here. I can, uh, I can help. Uh, it's me getting old. All right. I can say some of them too. You had a so, question earlier, what was your favorite game? Insomniac game. Uh, before that though, uh, someone asked mm -hmm. what was the most radical change on Spyro? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. And and that question, I think maybe between Disruptor and Spyro, well, the most radical change is probably the tone. We, we came from Disruptor, which we intended to be a more mature game. Mm -hmm. I think unintentionally it was goofy <laughs> because we made a lot we made a lot of uh, movies in the game that were just really cheesy and it ended up giving the game sort of this tongue in cheek faux serious feel mm -hmm. but it was still much darker and we wanted to make something that was more family friendly and again I'll give a lot of credit mm -hmm. to Mark Cerny who had said at the time look there are not many games on the PlayStation 1 that are family friendly why don't you guys think about doing something that can compete directly with Nintendo and mm -hmm. when he said that then we started talking about 
okay, let's think about characters, a type of character that would be fun to make and mm -hmm. that audiences might respond to, respond to. And Craig Stitt, one of our artists, came up with this. He said, let's make a game about a dragon. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, we, we worked on creating Spyro, and for a long time we called him Pete, because of Pete's dragon. And we were, in most cases, when we have a game in development, we have to give, a, give it a code name. So we called it Pete. And at the time when we had to come up with a real name, everybody wanted to keep calling it Pete. Which, I mean, it's just, it sounds like a totally goofy name, but at the time we had been saying it so so right. often that it felt like the right thing. It, was, it would have been a terrible name. Um, <laughs> Random. Wow! I, the, so these guys are new. This is again a Toys for Bob edition here. Uh, we did not uh -oh. do anything that it was this oh, little, uh, advanced, I guess. Tesla bots. Or yeah. Something. And this is great. I mean, it's really cool to see these in the reimagining of Spyro because <laughs> it gives oh. fans who play the original something new to to check out. And I think this is a cool. This game has a cool balance of the the old and the new. Yeah. Besides being absolutely beautiful, I mean, the, the grass <laughs> they did great. is just awesome, and that's this those little things. But you know, funny for us, grass making grass feel I, not repetitive, uh, making it beautiful, work with the palette, and sort of on the PlayStation One creating something that looked semi believable. That was a huge challenge for us on the art side, mm -hmm. I, it, because back then we had very little texture space, and we had to figure out how to tile grass in a way that wouldn't look like tiles. And I don't even remember how we did it, but somehow we managed to make it <laughs> look kind of believable. Oh. This, of course, is taking it a lot further. Well, you know, I mean, there's advances in technology and everything like that. Yes. I think for the time, it was pretty beautiful. Yeah, we, we thought we, we liked it. And pot, we had to like it because most of us spent day after day playing through levels over and over mm -hmm. and over and over again. I mean, I, I can't remember how many times I played the original. Just because we, we were the test group. Right. We were all the, we were the testers. Um, some, I think Key and Prime mentioned in chat that we have the family and fan day coming up soon in June. I think it's like June 8th, right before E3. And that's going to be in LA. Tickets are already sold out, so if you have not got it yet, sorry. it's. Oh, I'm playing. playing. Okay. Um, but that's going to be really awesome. <laughs> You're thinking I'm gonna do better? No, I'm not I mean, gonna do any better. I, than you are. We, we kind of pass it around. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, if you did get a ticket for that, if you're in the LA area, that's oh, yeah. gonna be really fun. Is yeah. that uh, what Two Bit Circus? Is that mm -hmm. what's called? Yeah, it's definitely gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. So there's a question here. Uh, do I do I remember anything that was added and then removed to Spyro One? I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. You can probably read it better than I can. Um, I think there were a lot of things that just didn't work, and that would be uh, different Nork types. Oh yeah. In fact, one of the biggest challenges we had early on was figuring out how to make the difference between flammable and chargeable norks obvious. And the armor was, oops, was the big one. So anything that was, eventually anything that was armored became, you must charge this. Mm. And then we, we tried to use size as well. And I'm not sure if that was as obvious because when you, when you see things from a distance, it's really difficult to tell if they're big or small, right. unless there are some good scale cues next to them. Uh, these guys are well differentiated, though. I mean, again, they're they're sort of new. Oh my yeah. god, these Tesla dudes are yeah, they're brutal. Rough. Yeah, I'm just gonna avoid him uh, because the little guys are standing next to the big guys. It's easier to tell that the big guys are big, mm -hmm. but we had uh, lots and lots of failed experiments with that. I don't remember having chickens in the game. <laughs> But I do remember, I think we had electricity. Yes, we did. That's right. I think that Toys R Bob just did a much better job of making, of sort of personalizing the... the uh... Yes, that's right. Okay, so we had to charge across. Oh, yeah. I oh! I thought it was off. <laughs> mm. I don't remember the guitar. We don't think we had a guitar, air guitar guys. Before. Okay, next. Uh, I'll give it a okay. shot. I'll, I'll read some more here. There was a question about Ratchet and Clank. There, there's some, I don't know if we want to get into Ratchet. I mean, we can, if you want. There's a couple people asking Ratchet stuff, too. Well, one, uh, F Grass one says, you can feel the Ratchet and Clank vibe in this game. Well, there, uh, we, we hadn't made Ratchet at this point, but 
when we did move on to Ratchet, the reason we did was because we felt that we had taken Spyro as far as we could without significantly changing his moveset, which we didn't want to do. And we also saw, we, we wanted to avoid another collectathon. Uh, at this point, on, on Spyro 3, which was 2000, there were a lot of games which asked you to just collect tons and tons and tons of stuff. And we wanted to make it a little different. So we wanted to introduce guns and upgradable stuff and uh, levels where you were, had the incentive to go back and find gadgets that could open up new levels. Those are the kind of things that we didn't see happening in platformers and we wanted to help introduce. So that's, that's why we moved on to Ratchet and why we didn't continue with Spyro. We also had one team at the time, and so we had to make a choice. What are we going to do? Do we want to stick with this or do something new? And as a young team that experienced some success, we wanted just to take it further and just keep keep going with new stuff, build new muscles. Let's see the other questions here. What do you guys think of the remake to your own? I'm not sure what that means, but I am uh, really impressed, as I continue to say, with what <laughs> Toys R Pop did. It's incredible. Uh, Go over to that one. What's my favorite Insomniac game? What do I? What did I enjoy working on the most? Whew, that's a tough one. I so I was creative director on all of the games up through Resistance Two, and that was sort of a mixed bag for Insomniacs because I did an average job as creative director, but I personally enjoyed it. I really liked Resistance because I, I'm a first-person shooter fan. And Resistance for us was a big departure from Ratchet, from the sort of the family-friendly vibe that we had been putting out there for for the last several years. And it, we got to go gritty and dark and tell a story that we thought was you know, unique in, mm -hmm. in light of all the World War II shooters that were out at the time. And it allowed us to stand out and give the, and the team was able to dive in and get really, really creative with the story and the chimera and who they were and the weapons too. So. I think moving my favorite time, I have lots of favorite times, but that transition going from, from Ratchet to Resistance was really exciting and brutal. It was really hard because it was a launch title for the PlayStation mm -hmm. 3, uh, but, but it was fun. Yeah, that's awesome to that we were able to go from you family to, I feel like studios would kind of get stuck in their ways a little bit, so that's just awesome that we're just like, oh, let's go mature route. Like, <laughs> well, yes, part of it's cool. It was also, it was uh, market motivated too because uh -huh. with the PlayStation, we knew that there was going there were going to be hardcore players mm -hmm. as early adopters. So we knew that a game like Ratchet or Spyro probably wouldn't work as well at the launch of the, of the mm -hmm. thing. Uh, then again, we at Insomniac like to work on lots of different things. Yeah. yeah. So when we felt like we could. I feel like Resistance would be one of our best games to adapt into a movie. If ah. it were to be made into a movie. It's just, it's so cinematic. I agree, I, I, and I, there's so much backstory that we never yeah. got to tell in Resistance. Uh, man, I remember making lots of maps and writing lots of uh, lore for Resistance that never showed up in the games. Someday. I feel like even the things that don't show up, they're still important because they inform the decision making of the stuff that does show up and make it feel like it's not paper thin. Yeah. You're right. Like, if you have that yeah. backbone, then yeah. the team also understands the reasons for mm -hmm. why certain things exist in the game. Right, right. Yeah. And then the players feel it. And it just feels like it's a yeah, just a, a deeper world. And uh, I mean, like Star Wars is the same way, where there's you know, after the movie comes out, they write all these books and da da da, explaining with this droid's backstory and this manufacturer of the spaceship da da da. And um, it's not in the movie, but you could just tell that like that type of thought was already happening from the designers when they're making it. Because it's just so it fits, out. it fits together. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's all of us as players or movie watchers or reading or when we read books, you can tell when things aren't quite fitting, right? right. And then you can also tell when people really have thought things through mm -hmm. and have connected the dots way in advance. Because you get part of the fun is connecting those dots on your own. Because the creators have left them as breadcrumbs, and then you have those yeah. those moment those eureka moments where you say, "Oh, I get it. This was because of that." I remember this level. Ooh, Conan. So I'm a big fan of Conan, both the um, late night show host and the barbarian. <laughs> I love both of them. And that dragon? And that dragon, yeah, yeah. All three of them. I don't remember calling a dragon Conan. Did we have a Conan in the original game? Maybe we did. 
We Certainly can fact yeah. check it with the, uh, I'm sure someone in the chat can verify. Yeah. Chat, did was Conan one of the dragons in the original game? And uh, also, well, we have this moment here. Oh, yeah. I will refresh. Zark Krin's asking, is it true that Mark Cerny designed treetops? Probably. Mark designed a lot of levels <laughs> over, over the insomniac history. So, we are playing all month long for St. Jude Play Live. If you watch our stream at insom.game slash play live, you can enter into our uh, weekly raffle for awesome prizes. We're going to be giving away signed Ratchet and Clank art books every Friday this month, and also a bunch of St. Jude swag. We have shirts and backpacks and a gaming chair, and we are anxious to give this away to you guys for supporting St. Jude. So again, one more time. Boom. Watch our stream right there. Insom.games slash playlife. Yeah, and please, please again, consider supporting St. Jude. They do amazing things for kids, and um, there really isn't an organization like them in terms of their their dedication to kids and, and helping them overcome illness. I, I saw a good question up there about uh, spring boxes, and I think the questioner asked, said, mentioned that there was only one red spring box in Spyro, one. I don't remember that, but that certainly could be true. We were we were definitely into, and are still into Easter eggs and doing things that players can talk about because they only saw it once, mm -hmm. or something special happened in the game. But that reminds me that when we were when we were <laughs> brainstorming on what to do <laughs> for chests, you, you can catch them. <laughs> You're awesome. Oh, you, got you got him! him. Yeah. Oh, you got him! Oh, God. <laughs> uh, we we really we knew that we would have to do something other than just your standard treasure chest because that got old pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with a whole bunch of different chests, and we wanted to make them uh, connected to Spyro's move set, and so that you would have to do different things as Spyro to find the rewards in the chests versus just flaming every single one. That, that was fun, and I think we had a lot of success and failures in that area or early on when we were trying out different types of chests. So again, part of game development, you, uh, rewards are incredibly important. right? You want players to feel, when they find a chest, that it's an exciting moment for them. Mm -hmm. that, that it's not just, oh, I'm picking up something. You know, there needs to be some sort of interaction that feels satisfying. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, yeah, other questions. Uh, what stage is your favorite from the Spyro Trilogy? Whew. Let's see. Uh, the Magic Crafter stage, when you first, when you get into Magic Crafters from the first game, I think that might have been my favorite, mostly because it reminded me of the prototype that we did to prove that Spyro could be a game. We had uh, we had built this sort of plateau, this series of plateaus with white marble structures on top of checkerboard floors with sort of a pastoral surrounding mm -hmm. and it had sort of an overall pastel pinkish feel and that evolved into Magic Crafters. At least we took a lot of inspiration from that from Magic Crafters and I think that's, we had wizards and other things in there too. So that was sort of a direct homage to the various fantasy inspirations that most of us had, whether it was movies or books or mm -hmm. other things. I remember that level. It kind of reminded me of Alice in Wonderland almost, because the checkerboard yeah. thing. Yeah. The chess. Uh, yeah. Oh, me? Right, okay. Ted, you're up. Oh, Ted, I have a, a random question for you not related to video games at all. I know that you have a little bit of martial arts experience. Nobody ever asked that. <laughs> yes. So... Has there ever been a situation where there are some <laughs> bad guys up to no good and you had to kind of do some martial arts to put them in their place and then you had the opportunity to say, the price is right. And <laughs> Thank, <you're> just, like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, no. <laughs> I, I mean, one thing I've learned, I've been practicing martial arts for, gosh, I think maybe close to 30 years now. Uh, one thing I've learned is getting into a fight is probably the stupidest thing you can do. Right. I mean, there's just absolutely, if, unless you're, you, your life or someone you love's life is in danger, there really isn't any reason to ever mm -hmm. get involved in physical altercations. Just because the consequences are, can be so serious. Somebody can die, yeah. somebody mm -hmm. can get hurt, you get sued. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And if you can't solve a problem through mediation or talking or just walking away, 
then you know that's an issue. Uh, so I, one of the great things about martial arts, at least for me, is it does give you the confidence to talk things out in a situation which may be stressful, right? Mm -hmm. Where somebody is clearly agitated or is interested in causing you harm. I think that if you aren't confident, then then that flight, fight or flight uh, reaction tends to come up much more quickly, and it's hard to deny both of those things. So, and I I'm, I have been in a few situations where. It, they have. They could have devolved into very serious physical altercations, and fortunately, I, I had some training and felt like, okay, I don't need. To, I don't need to escalate this. I yeah. can just be confident and either walk away or talk it through. I have two follow-up thoughts about that. The first, are you, are you practicing martial arts? Is that what you're? No, I. I mean, I. I did jujitsu for like a year, and I did taekwondo when I was little. But I'm. I'm a poser. But. Um, <laughs> Any, so, any of that's great. I mean, any. But I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, though. And um, so, Brian Intahar, creative director on Spider Man, he's a big fan of Cobra Kai from Karate Kid. <laughs> and I think he identifies more with Cobra Kai, and they kind of go against, you know, the philosophy you just spoke about, where it's like, you know, sp you know don't just go running into a fight, and like, it's a last resort. You don't want to do that. You just want to train yourself. It's about everything else but actually fighting somebody. And I think oh, that... Poetry. I'm not saying that Intahar is, you know, um, he's, someone is a fighter, but I'm saying he's really in that Cobra Kai camp. Like, he's... He is a big fan of that show on YouTube, and, and he quotes the movie, and, you know, put him in a body bag, sweep the leg, you know, all that stuff, and... Um, Brian, but Brian is a fantastic <laughs> diplomat. I will, I will give him that. Mm -hmm. He's also a former college athlete too. So, and he, mm. he actually he and I played the same sport in college. So we we identify. Over what, which sport is that? Lacrosse. Oh, lacrosse. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And All he's right. he is. Uh, he, if he, everybody on the stream knows Brian, he's mm. a big guy. He's a big imposing yeah. guy, but he's also one of the sweetest people around. Yeah. And I think I can see him being the kind of guy who really doesn't need to say anything because his physical presence mm -hmm. is somewhat intimidating so but if he did I can imagine him talking pretty much anybody off of a ledge he's, he's just good at that yeah he is and when you deal with production I, I got lost uh, when you deal with production challenges all the time you're dealing with people who are you know maybe stressed and mm -hmm. need answers immediately and you have to be calm in those situations and he is oh yeah there's been a couple times you know when I'm in the thick of things on E3 or whatever and, and I'm you know a little stressed out and I put things in perspective thinking about the scope of the challenges that someone like Brian faces or that you face and I'm like wow this is a lot for a human being to be able to handle and like the <laughs> skill involved because for me and I mean I don't have you know like a wife and kids or even a pet and there are times when I'm working on stuff and it, be, it you know I get really into it and I'm like okay this is a big focus for me right now and then I think about the people that are way high up, you know, you and Brian, or you know, people that are like, you know, major producers at Sony. I'm like, man, that's that's a that's a big deal, decision making and responsibility. And then the fact that you guys are able to do it I think without it's freaking out, like you guys are really cool about it, you know. And I'm like, wow. That, I mean, obviously, the reason why you're the ones doing it is because you're able to do it without freaking out. Because you know, if you I've never seen to, Corey, I've never seen you freak out. <laughs> I think everybody is capable of. You know, mm -hmm. t uh, taking on pretty much any challenge as long as you try to keep things in perspective, and I think you you both do. I oh, mean, you thanks. guys have you guys have produced some of the coolest coolest. This is a, like mutual love fest now, mm -hmm. but <laughs> it is true. You guys have produced some of the coolest trailers I've seen out there, oh. and I think people forget that the amazing Spider-Man trailers out there, with the exception of the one uh, the the commercial TV commercial, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you guys did all that. It's incredible, right? Well, thanks. I mean, and it's you know, definitely it's like everybody in the studio contributed in major ways i mean we make these things it's like a big team effort where we get together with all the the leads and then figure out the plan and then we work with the individual team members and animation to get specific shots or lighting artists to you know get the shot the way we want it and it's you know we're the one that edits the trailer but it's like so many people come together to make it mm -hmm. so Sure. Cool. Okay. But I'll happily so, take all the credit so, for it. That's fine. So, Corey, just actually going back to what you were pointing out before, it doesn't matter what level you're at. You cannot, you cannot 
lead a team or be on a team without working with other people, right? right. I mean, you have to be able to do that. And so what this is pretty cool about what we do here mm -hmm. is we all generally have the same interest, the same desire, the same direction that mm -hmm. we're facing. And that makes creating games a lot easier mm -hmm. than if we're all going, oh, I, that guy's an idiot because <laughs> he wants to make something about, I don't know, bananas. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving you good examples. <laughs> but... Um, I mean, I want a banana game. I don't know about you guys. I've been saying that since day one. <laughs> Someday, Corey, we will make that banana game for you. Uh, okay, I remember this level. This one with the this was a, an Alan Mandron special. So I don't know how much we talk about Alan on oh. the games, mm -hmm. on the on the streams, but Alan was our only animator for Spyro. He modeled and, and animated all of the characters in this game. Wow! And also concepted the majority of them. So <laughs> when it came time to say create a brand new level, we talk about the story and the setting, and then Alan would just fill it in with crazy weird characters, like this giant woman with the spoon, <laughs> and sending off her little faux knights to charge you. I mean, just bizarre stuff. And it got more bizarre, to Alan's credit, in Spyro 2 and Spyro 3. Mm -hmm. So in Spyro 3, there are some characters, or there are characters in a cave who's Stomachs open up and bats come out <laughs> out of their stomachs, right? Just weird. That is like some vampire hunter thing. <laughs> I don't know what inspired him, but <laughs> I think he was just kind of running out of uh, ideas and said, "What's the weirdest possible thing I could do here?" Which was again, that was us in saying to every team member, "Hey, everybody is creating here, so let's just figure out what our general direction is and create within those constraints." Yeah. And we got some really cool stuff. Ah. And a lot of it, I think, would come from the initial layout, which Mark or Michael would do, and then we'd fill in the blanks with character, and this is after we'd come up with the story, mm -hmm. and then we'd build the environment. Yeah. Our, our production practices are pretty similar in terms of how we do things, and come up with the story, the, the general theme for the level, uh, do some layout, figure out what enemies are going to be there. Oh, this guy's a little tough. Oh, I yes, yeah. that's right. He's one of our mini bosses, and I don't, I don't think I can kill him with just a charge. I think. Oh, I think it behind him. Yeah, it's behind him. It's yeah, sort of flames, right? Yes. So here we go. This is sort of a. I think at the time, there may not have been too many bosses where you had to circle around behind him. We, I think we felt kind of clever about that. Kind of. Oh, and he's got a much more realistic butt than <laughs> when we created him. <laughs> That'll make it Next gen happy. butt crack. Yeah. <laughs> see. Oh, more of them. Okay, so yes. We also learned that it was important to reuse things. Oh, they're uh, uh, they're asking if the character that sends out bats is he called Scorch? Is that the name? Oh my gosh. The character who sends out what? Bats from their stomach. They're, uh, I think their name might be Scorch. Uh, the is that. Or maybe the level was called that? I don't remember naming the characters too frequently here. Okay, when you guys I'll give it a shot. Uh, oh, Art of Zombie, goodbye. Thanks for stopping by. All right. oh, that's really good to hear. So, uh, Art of Zombie said, uh, Ratchet and Clank got us through some dark, dark time. Got him through some dark times, or her. Uh, that is one of the big reasons we make games. It's really gratifying for all of us to hear stories of how our games somehow help people. Sometimes it helps people connect with others, sometimes it helps them uh, get through a dark time, uh, deal with the challenge. And it's surprising to me how many fans will come up to all of us and, and just yeah. volunteer these moments that are where our games have made a difference in their lives. And mm -hmm. that is one of the reasons we, our vision is to you know, create games that have a, last, long, a lasting and positive impact on people's lives. And it's, that just validates it. So thank you. Definitely. Okay, yeah, so Art of Zombies awesome. Um, they make uh, a lot of cool fan art that we featured on our Fan Art Friday shows before. Huh. Really good stuff. That is cool. The trophy, sa the trophy Sandler is saying, "Don't know Insomniac is making VR titles. I'm super happy how the PS5 will handle the ports. I do know Insomniac is as they handle remote mess." Okay, so something about VR. Uh, we are making VR games. Stormland is a game that we announced last year. It's a game for Oculus Rift and is really coming along well. It's an, it's an open world VR game with some pretty unique traversal approaches in it. 
coming soon. Oh yeah. Oh, you know what? I gotta keep my glasses on. I that feel game I... is awesome, by the way. Um, you know, we made the what was it? The last trailer was mm-hmm. for PAX East the, a couple months ago. Justin and I went out and helped with that. Yeah. And just in the couple months since we worked on that, and now we're you know just looking at all the updates going into the game, and like they're really pushing the envelope with the worlds, and it's just gorgeous. It's yeah. it's something I want to keep checking out and um, just you know immersing myself in there because of like all the different worlds in the game are just they're so beautiful. And uh, I'm really surprised and like impressed with what the team's able to do because there's a lot of constraints working in VR. Yeah, yeah being able to move around and stuff. And yeah, and Starlight, but awesome. they've they they figured sick. out yeah. like so many you know solutions yeah. to make it really cool and really beautiful. Yeah, and I'm really excited to show more about it when we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what nice to see too. Like from like Edge of Nowhere to Arrow Rights and Spoken to mm-hmm. like where we are with Starland and stuff. Just like you feel like you're. It, all that, all that stuff. Like yeah, it does feel like the yeah. culmination, culmination of like a couple of their games where we learned a lot. Yeah, just learning more and more about VR. That's true. <laughs> uh, same, same, same phone who dis probably. Same phone who dis yeah. asks, "What's an average day at work like for me?" Uh, no day is the same. I'm lucky in that way <laughs> uh, because there's always something different happening, whether it's. Uh, the cultural issue where I'm jumping in on something, oh, just getting to play games that are in progress, which is a lot of what I do, and giving feedback, what you can do uh, is, meeting um, with uh, various groups travel. around Insomniac to talk about production practices, mm, things that are coming up in terms of future plans, all those things, or maybe working with our publishers, It's it changes every single day. And that's kind of been my life for the last 25 years at Insomniac. Every, mm-hmm. every day has been different. And it's not just because of the corporate side, it's also because I got a chance to work, actually create assets for games like Spyro or Disruptor or Ratchet. And that was a lot of fun. And the other artists tolerated me. They <laughs> let me do my thing without criticizing me too badly. And I should say the other, the artists, not the other artists, because I wouldn't really consider myself an artist, but I did get to do some art and that was, that was fun. Man. You're, wow. nah, I think you're being hard on yourself. Like I think of you, kind of like what I tell other people, is that you're like Bill Pullman in Independence Day. Like you get in the fighter jet at the end. You don't, you're not just like, oh yeah, I'm the <laughs> boss, but I'm, myself. I'm not yeah. gonna get in the jet though. I'm just gonna tell you guys what to do. It's like no, you get in the jet and you go fight that mothership with all the other guys. You know, like you're you know how to get your hands dirty and like, I mean even like your After Effects skills. Sometimes, you know, you're creeping up on me and making me you know, stay on top of my game because I'm like, uh-oh, I gotta watch out because it's not even the thing you do, but you're really good at it. So. I appreciate that. That's that's funny you mentioned that. We Way back when we had to make presentations to publishers to pitch various things, mm-hmm. if I did, I mean, that was sort of a necessity. We had to actually do some sort of video presentation. But no, I can't hold a candle with you guys. You guys are pros. <laughs> Which is which is great. I, I actually get to be impressed by what. Uh, okay, mutual love fest mm-hmm. again. But it is true. We all we all have our various specialties and expertises, mm-hmm. and you guys do yours. I just occasionally get to dabble. I'm lucky like that. Well, I'm glad fun. that you're still able to dabble, and that, you know, you're like. I've been in old jobs before where there's like this kind of ivory tower thing, with the leadership. But I definitely feel like you're, you know going through things with us and yeah. you're not like just standing above like kind of uh distant and disconnected from the real world situation you're like well the, you i get it and you, you've made the stuff yourself and everything and you know it's that's important right i think anybody all of us have to understand what goes into making games because the arguments that we get into over design or production schedules have to be informed and it's so, and I know it frustrates insomniacs here for, who come from other companies because they may be talking to a producer who doesn't really know how long it takes to make certain things. Right. So it's going, well, why does it take you X hours <laughs> to do this? And oh, no. the artist or the programmer is saying, because that's what it takes. These are the tools I have. And this is, are you cheating? <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, it's well, the, oh, it's they the, saved they me. saved you. They right. saved me. God, I thought that was a cheat. It looked like a cheat for a second. Um, Oh yeah, you can. Jump. That was I forgot yeah, about that. Woo. Oh, I'm okay. I'm anyway, we, at Insomniac, we definitely espouse. Or we strongly believe that if you have the opportunity to make stuff, you should. 
just because it helps inform everybody. I will also say that those who don't, uh, who have chosen, say, project management as a career uh, or other aspects that don't allow them to touch assets, they're, we do spend a lot of time understanding what we all, what each other does, mm -hmm. and yeah. versus just saying, ah, I don't care what lay level layout means. I don't, I don't care. Just tell me you know, yeah. how long it'll take. Now, people actually do make an effort, and I think a lot of that is also driven by our interest in games in general. Right when you when we all we grew up playing games, all of us, I know most of us thought, man, it would be really cool to do that someday. I wonder how people do that. Yeah. And now we're sitting in the middle of it, you know, getting to see the evolution of game production uh, year by year, and that's that's really exciting and cool. Uh, and then probably some more questions. Okay. And uh, I want to redo one more time while we still have ten more minutes left. If you're just tuning in. Or if you haven't already, you should definitely check out the link in some.game slash play live and consider supporting St. Jude because if you do, you will be entered in one of our weekly raffles to win a whole bunch of cool prizes, including a signed Ratchet and Clank art book. Great. Uh, there's a great comment. Let's not knock ivory towers for those in them. It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know. Um, Okay. Oh, you got to use supercharge to kill the spiders. Yeah. That's uh, what okay. OJ Po. I can't. I think that's what it says. Justin, do you want oh, to give so us a shot? Do you have to like run down that ramp and then like turn into the spider world? Uh, something like that. I mean, do you have to kill it? If you kill it, it like. So, uh, Eight Bit Buzz has a good point. Uh, preservation of game development stuff like magazines, footage, prototypes. What's your take on it? That's that's something that's, for, especially if you're in development all the time, like we are, it's really easy to forget that many of our old maps and production designs are kind of treasures. And I, I look back at some of the nice. some <laughs> of the production sketches that Catherine Hardwick, who was the director of Twilight Twilight series, by the way, mm -hmm. made for Disruptor. I I think God, that stuff is awesome, and they're around somewhere, but I can't remember where. I also know that the video we recorded of our very first demo in 1994 for Disruptor, where Al Hastings and I built it, is around somewhere, but I don't know where it is. So, bad on me, but I, we do need to archive this stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, to that point, one of the cool things that's happening is the Smithsonian Lemelson Archives, uh, under the leadership of Chris Weaver, has put to, has been putting together a series of interviews of. I, the true pioneers of the video game age, and I had I had the good fortune to go back to Washington, to the Smithsonian, I think it was this winter, and see the original Space Wars team. These are the guys oh, who wow. made Space Wars in 1962, uh -huh. up on stage talking about how they programmed the PDP, which was one of the first mainframes that could actually host a game, um, how they did it, and it was fascinating because these guys are in their 80s and 90s, I think. Yeah, oh, wow. And thinking back to what challenges they had working with, I don't know, maybe a K of memory. And <laughs> I just insane. And they managed to make a game that, to this day, I find really fun. And if you've ever had a chance to play Space Wars in the arcade, it's a it's a game where you're, you've got a gravity well and you've got two spaceships oh. that are sort of orbiting each other, shooting at each other. Right. It's a super fun game super responsive game that is uh, a blast. And of course it's probably emulated all over the place on the internet, but I remember, I'm sorry I'm going off now, but I remember as a kid in 1977 maybe, playing the the arcade version of that in a movie theater, my first arcade game, and I'm just going, oh, this is incredible. Were you at the movie theater to see Star Wars? Same year. That was about the same, yeah, the same year, <laughs> was I? Maybe. That would be a pretty nice one-two combo. I could only imagine like living in a world where you hadn't played a game like that yet, and you hadn't seen Star Wars yet, and then you go and you get both on the same night. It's like, oh, yeah. I might grow up and make video games for a living. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I certainly, I think I was definitely, I remember being inspired by that game and going, I would love to make yeah. something like this someday. Mm -hmm. uh, I also remember watching Star Wars. I remember there was a, that was, I think, the year, and the internet can correct me here, that Leonard Skinner's plane crashed, and they had, or maybe it was the year before, and they had a, a trailer prior to Star Wars showing, it was sort of an homage to Leonard Skinner, and that was another mm. moment for me, because I'm a Leonard Skinner fan. Mm. 
I imagine most people don't even remember who Leonard Skinner is, but Freebird. Yeah. They did Freebird, everybody. Free bird. That's yeah. right. Freebird. You got no Freebird. <laughs> A lot of other really good songs. And they're still around. At least with the, the lead singer's brother now singing. Okay, enough about music. <laughs> so, Spyro, so we're, what level are we on? Because I haven't been paying attention. Oh, crud. Um, oh, we're on uh, High Caves. Okay. High Caves, oh. and Magic Justin crackers. got pretty far now. Oh, we're stuck. Great. Look at those moving platforms. Another thing we didn't ha have, I don't yeah. think. Or did we? I'll figure out. Oh, oh wait, maybe we did. Was it moving platforms? I can't remember. I think, well, I remember that there were some jumps that we had to do in this level where there were moving, meeting yeah. the tilting platforms. Oh, oh, it's it's it, yeah. not not just the, we had moving platforms, but I don't, I didn't know if right, we had to get tilting. Let's see. All right, we're going to wrap it up in a minute here, so let's get in our final words. Oh, here, you want to put the playlist stuff up? Oh, sure. Let's um, see. Oh, you got it. Uh, this is a full screen oh, sorry, one. These two are like the... Alright, here we go. Oh, so Zero Magnitude's talking about the Insomniac Museum in Ratchet 2. And he says, one of the, here, they said, it's one of the main reasons they wanted to become and became a game developer. That's awesome. You know, that's, again, the kind of thing that is really gratifying for all of us in Insomniac to hear that. That, the Insomniac Museum. I can't even remember who came up with the idea, but it was something that everybody here was excited about because there were so many things that just didn't work in our games that we would just ax. And we wanted a way to show them and all the work that went into them in a way that wasn't, that didn't hurt the game. And so the Insomniac Museum was our sort of, uh, our hall of misfits that eventually became a thing in our games. We gotta do that more often. I don't think we've done that in a while. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the, fan favorites too. I think that people are always talking about that. Yeah. You remember that speedrunner guy came in and he was just talking about how like the office is laid out just like in, yeah. one, in one of them, uh, in one of the games. That's right. At some museums. And it was this office. Yeah. Which is, it shows you how long we've been in this office. Yeah. So what do I do? Do I just run and jump I think from it's, here? I think you have to be on that, that snow platform over there. Oh, from there? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't think you'll make it from here. Okay. Well, how do I, I, how do I over there. get over there? And maybe maybe you could around. try. Maybe you could try. Uh, yeah, I tried earlier and failed, but I was lower. So El Elconzo ninety six is asking, what steps would they need to get into the industry? And this person is studying computer science. I'd say, okay, I'll try again. One of the greatest things you can do right now is make games yourself, because if you're if you're a CS major, you clearly know enough to start programming games, and you can use Unity or Unreal or other uh, game develop prototyping sets out there, and begin, just begin making your own stuff. And the graphics don't have to be great, design doesn't have to be great, but there's nothing like the experience of actually putting something together and understanding why it works and why it doesn't work. What's also great is that in, uh, today, thanks to the internet, there are a ton of people who can give you feedback on your game, so depending on what tool set you're using, you can yeah, certainly go to forums and post yeah, your right stuff right. and say, what do you think, and get good constructive criticism. And that's actually how we do it here at Insomniac. We constantly are prototyping new ideas and asking, what do you think? And getting that feedback from your teammates or from peers is invaluable, because generally they're giving you objective feedback on what the fun factor was. What do they like about it? What do they find frustrating? How can you improve? And that only makes you better. Uh, the last thing you want to do is develop in a bubble because if you're just developing and assuming that everybody's going to love your stuff, you're probably going to be wrong. Uh, so try to expose your experiments as soon as you can, be my suggestion. That is excellent mm -hmm. suggestions, actually. And we get that question a lot, and I think that's definitely the right answer. And it's like the one that seems to be the recurring one. Like when people have asked that when like Jacinda's on stream and Brian's on stream and you know, different designers are on stream, and it's always something related like that. Was like just get out and do it, yeah, make yeah. it, share it, and and just learn. Yeah. You know, so Your practice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what's incredible is uh, those of us who grew up without the internet. Uh, I mean, I when I went to school, there wasn't really internet, and we had to rely on a very, very, very small set of uh, of critics to tell us what worked and what didn't. And so you were, I was completely reliant on just a handful of teachers who would tell me. Uh, you're doing this right or you're doing this wrong. Today, I can rely on millions and millions of people yeah. who can give me 
probably even better informed feedback. Yeah, like forums that people like really care like yeah. about what you're doing. They're not like ripping you apart. You know, like just being. Yeah, like, yeah and you can like find somebody's... people to collaborate with yeah, too. Yeah. Just yes, for sure. Putting yourself out there, and there's all yeah. these different events and mm -hmm. conventions and stuff. Yeah, and so much yeah, support out there for yeah, sure. There's a lot. Um, all right, well, we're out of time. I could sit and talk about this stuff like <laughs> all day, but we got to get back to work. Uh, for everyone watching, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, I'm going to do one more shout out for St. Jude Play Live, which we're doing all month long. Um, oh, we have our schedule even too here. Hold on one sec. Let me bring this up. So we're going right to left this week because it's like you're reading it in <laughs> Asia, okay? Oh so <laughs> next, well, we're they're gonna play Spyro in, uh, tomorrow in Durham, and then. Wednesday we're gonna play Ratchet and Clank. Which one? Who knows? You gotta tune in and see. And then um, Thursday in Durham, and then Friday here we're gonna play Into the Nexus. So that will be very exciting. And in the meantime, when you're watching our stream, definitely watch it at this link in slash play live because we're doing weekly giveaways and you're also supporting a great cause. Ted, thanks so much for joining us. This was an awesome stream. Thank you, thank you guys for supporting St. Jude's and for joining us today. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll see you again next time. Yes.